I would like to talk about Stokes' theorem, especially its applications to the physical sciences. Stokes' theorem relates the circulation of a vector field, defined on the left side, as the line integral, an oriented line integral, of the vector field dotted with the arc length vector dr. And on the right side, it relates it to a surface integral of the curl of the vector field. So this is sometimes called the curl of the vector field. Dotted with the normal vector to the surface, d sigma. So it might be a good idea to draw a little picture to identify all these ingredients. So here's a surface S and the boundary of that surface is this curve C. There is a normal vector to the surface at every point. And if you take the unit outward normal convention, that would be the normal vector. Now, the once you've adopted the normal vector convention, the curve itself gets an orientation based on the right-hand rule. If you go around the curve with your right hand fingers, then the thumb will point in the direction of the normal vector that you've chosen. So this curve gets an orientation based on the normal vector choice. Okay, once you've done all that, you have set up the uh, theorem. The vector field can be any vector field that depends on sp uh, uh, the position wherever you are. So the vector field goes all over the place in the surface. And what this tells us that if you accumulate what's known as a curl, curl gives you the rotational tendency of the vector field and the proof of Stokes' theorem, you can literally see this rotational tendency developing on the right side. If you take all these rotational tendencies or vortices on the surface and integrate them, that is the same as taking the vector field along the line and integrating it on the boundary. So on the boundary, you're just going to have the vector field is going to be in different directions on the boundary also, but that's only one small part of what's happening in the whole on the whole surface. Uh, Stokes' theorem allows us to just look at the boundary of what's hap uh, o happening over here and deduce from that everything that's happening all over the surface. So it's another very important theorem which connects the boundary data to the global uh, bulk data, similar to Gauss' theorem. Now, Stokes' theorem is very useful when you have things that depend on circulation. A classic example in physics is the magnetic field of a wire. If you have a wire carrying current, you are usually study this in uh, elementary uh, university physics too or something, some place like that. Uh, the magnetic fields are going to be concentric circles around the wire like that. You can actually find the magnetic field around a wire carrying current using Stokes' theorem. To do that, you may have to first convert it into the form that you're familiar with in university physics. That's done by one of the Maxwell equations. So one of the four Maxwell equations is the following. The curl of the magnetic field is mu naught, which is some constant of nature called permeability of vacuum, times the current density J. So current density has got units of current per square meter. Magnetic field is usually measured in Teslas. Anyway, so that's the uh, one of the Maxwell equations that you have. So you can substitute that there if you put V equals B. So let's do that. I'm going to get the circulation of the magnetic field B, which is going to be the integral of the uh, over the boundary of the surface B dot dr equals the double integral S curl of B, for which I'm going to write mu naught j dot n d sigma. 
what's usually done in elementary grades is you recognize dot n d sigma as dA and you write this as j dot dA and you call this the enclosed current, current enclosed by the surface S. So let's suppose that you have an Amperin uh, loop. These circles are called Amperin loop. In general, the loops don't have to have any um, rhyme or reason, but since we already kind of sort of know that the magnetic field is going to be concentric circles, let us choose an Amperin loop that's also a concentric circle. So the one I'm drawing in red is the Amperin loop. And we're going to choose the uh, orientation of this in the manner that's consistent with the direction of the current. The surface that you have is this one. So rather than speak of the current density in this case, the current density is going to be a delta function because the current is a, a singular uh, distribution. It's just a thin, infinitesimally thin wire, so there's no real j here in this problem unless you write j as a delta function. So you can certainly write j as i times delta um, z or something like that uh, if this is the um, z axis and the x axis and that's the y axis then I'll write it as delta z delta x that will be the current density um, but we're not going to bother too much with this uh, way of writing it when we study delta functions later we'll talk more about that uh, in the in the j hat direction so this looks awfully confusing to you probably because there's a j here that indicates current density there's i that indicates the current Delta Z and Delta X give you the location in the XY plane. So I've chosen this to be um, the X direction and that to be the Y direction and the perpendicular direction to that, the Z direction. So just forget about that. Don't worry too much about that. Ultimately, you're going to get the enclosed current and that's how it's used in the elementary grades. Then what you do is you use some symmetry argument and uh, say that the magnetic field B is in the same direction as a dr vector. Uh, incidentally, the dr vector is tangent to the um, r vector. And I just, uh, since this part is somewhat confusing, I want to just spend some time on that. Why is the dr vector tangent to the r vector? I think this part is pretty important. So let's suppose you have an r vector. r vector starts from some origin and goes up to some point and you go to a new location, let's call that r prime. The dr vector is actually this vector here. So dr by vector addition, dr plus r equals r prime. So what dr tells us is it's r, my, r prime minus r, the new location minus the old location uh, in the limit of course. So this is truly not speaking not dr but something like delta r. And in the limit, as r approaches r prime, that's when you get dr. So dr is definitely tangent to the curve, even though r is a radial vector. So I just want to make that very clear because some people seeing dr may wonder, well, how is that tangent? It looks radial. The radial part is r, the tangent part is dr. Okay, once you have that symmetry of B and DR being parallel, then you can uh, write the left-hand side as just being the line integral without orientation, because I've chosen the orientation already, of B DR cosine zero degrees over the curve. And that's going to just be uh, B will no longer be a um, you don't have to worry about you're going around this circle. So the, it's going to be the integral of dr. It could be a function of r, but the dr is going around the circle. It's not a um, integration perpendicular to it. So I'll just get integral of dr along the curve c, and that's also called the circumference of a circle. All these little drs added up when you go around gives you the circumference, which is 2 pi r. And that's equal to mu naught over i, uh, mu naught times i, and that gives us the magnetic field of a wire mu naught i over 2 pi r. It tells us correctly the magnetic field decreases with distance and 
if the current doubles, the magnetic field doubles, so it kind of depends on how big the current is also. Uh, mu naught has got um, a value. It's uh, 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 uh, tesla meter per ampere. So you can see it's a really small amount and typical, uh, even if you had something like a 10 ampere uh, typical house wire, actually let's make it 100 ampere. The house wire that comes into your mains is 100 amperes. So let's find out how much the magnetic field is going to be one meter away from it. Uh, B at one meter distance is going to be 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 tesla meter per ampere times 100 amperes uh, divided by 2 pi times 1 meter which is basically 2 pi so that's 2 I get uh, that's 10 to the minus 7 so I get 2 times 10 to the minus 5 um, teslas you, you amperes cancel out the meters cancel out and you're left with this one unit tesla uh, and that's 20 micro teslas uh, as a reference point the Earth's magnetic field, B Earth, is about 60 microteslas in uh, Rochester, New York. It varies from place to place and the orientation varies from place to place, uh, but that's roughly what it is. So uh, Ampere's law helps us um, find and, and Ampere, uh, this magnetic field and Ampere's law in turn is a consequence of Stokes' theorem. There are many, many things I can discuss within the context of uh, Stokes' theorem. I just want to leave you with one interesting tidbit. It's a little advanced comment, and I think some of you are jonesing for some advanced things in these videos, so I'll just throw that out there. When you come to advanced classes, especially when you study differential geometry, you will find that there's only one theorem, and that's a generalized Stoke theorem. So I'll mention the generalized Stokes theorem. This is advanced material not tested in your course and you will not be responsible for this in any manner. I just want to tell you this so that people who are interested in learning more can go and read up on their own. The generalized Stokes theorem applies in n dimensions. It is stated in the language of differential forms. So if omega is a p form, now again these are words I'm not explaining to you right now. I'm just giving this as a little tidbit to show you that Stokes theorem is not just this uh, little thing I've shown you. It's a way more general thing in mathematics. In mathematics, there's only one theorem. There's no Gauss theorem, uh, Gauss divergence theorem. There's no Green's theorem, nothing. The generalized Stokes theorem is the only theorem in higher mathematics. If omega is a P form, then the quantity d omega which I'm still not told totally you what it is. It's called the uh, differential of a p form. Uh, this is a p plus one form. Okay. If you want to read about p forms and all that, I'll give you good references in the class. But right now, I'm just giving you uh, the statement of generalized Stokes theorem for the interests of uh, uh, in the interest of time. Now I'll, I'll just write it. The integral of the p form on the boundary of uh, a p plus 1 cycle is equal to the integral over the p plus 1 cycle of the p plus 1 form. So this is the content of Stokes theorem in higher dimensions in the generalized setting. From this theorem, every other theorem you learned in your life, like Gauss's law or the regular Stokes law, Ampere's law, um, Faraday's law, just about anything else, Green's theorem in, in the plane can be derived as a special consequence of this. So uh, C is a P plus 1 cycle. So I'll just leave it at that and whet your appetite. I think it's best for me not to explain too much so that people who are interested in this type of uh, higher mathematics can go investigate it on their own.